This morning we're going to have no slides, and the reason why is because we have such a voluminous amount of text we're covering this morning. There's really no point. So let me encourage you to open this if you have it. If you bring your Bible, open it up to 1 Samuel chapter 9. If you have your phone or a tablet or something like that where you can follow along, I encourage you to do that because we're going to be reading a lot of text. The book of Samuel begins with these words. There was a certain man. And then it'll tell the story of Elkanah and Hannah, uh, Samuel's parents. And we'll go on then to tell us the story of Samuel. When we get to chapter 9, we, enter, we encounter similar words. There was a man. A sure sign to all of us that we're now beginning a new narrative. And this is going to be a new story. This is the beginning of the story of Saul. And let me tell you right now, it's a bit of a tragedy, Saul's story. You wouldn't know it from what we're about to read this morning, but it's true. It's, it's not going to end well for Saul. Uh, that's one way of putting it. So again, if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn to first chapter Samuel uh, the First Samuel chapter uh, ten or nine, and we're going to read nine through ten, verse sixteen. It's a lot of text, so stay with me. I'm going to be reading from the ESV, which is the Bibles that we have here at this church. First Samuel chapter nine, beginning at verse one. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Becherah, son of Aphia, a Benjamite, a man of wealth. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. So Kish said to Saul, his son, Take one of the young men with you and arise, go and look for the donkeys. And he passed through the hill country of Ephraim and passed through the land of Shalisha, but they did not find them. And they passed through the land of Sha'alim, but they were not there. Then they passed through the land of Benjamin, but he did not find them. Then they came to the land of Zuf. Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, let us go back, lest my father cease to care about the donkeys and become anxious about us. But his servant said to him, Behold, there is a man of God in this city, and he is a man who is held in honor. All that he says comes true. So now let us go there. Perhaps he can tell us the way we should go. Then Saul said to his servant, but if we go, what can we bring the man? For the bread in our sacks is gone, and there is no present to bring to the man of God. What do we have? The servant answered Saul again, Here, I have with me a quarter of a shekel of silver, and I will give it to the man of God to tell us our way. Now formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he said, Come, let us go to the seer, for today's prophet was formerly called a seer. And Saul said to his servant, Well said, come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. As they went up the hill to the city, they met young women coming out to draw water and said to them, Is the seer here? They answered, He is. Behold, he is just ahead of you. Hurry, he has come just now to the city because the people have a sacrifice today on the high place. As soon as you enter the city, you will find him. Before he goes up to the high place to eat, you will find him. For the people will not eat till he comes, since he must bless the sacrifice. Afterwards, th those who are invited will eat. Now go up, for you will meet him immediately. So they went up to the city. As they were entering the city, they saw Samuel coming out toward them on his way up to the high place. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel... Tomorrow, about this time, I will send to you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel. 
He shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have seen my people because their cry has come to me. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, Here is the man of whom I spoke to you. He it is who shall restrain my people. And then Saul approached Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me, where is the house of the seer? Samuel answered Saul, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for today you shall eat with me. And in the morning I will let you go and will tell you all that it is on your mind. As for the donkeys that were lost three, day, three days ago, do not set your mind on them, for they have been found. And for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for all your father's house? Saul answered, Am I not a Benjamite from the least of the tribes of Israel? And is not my clan the humblest of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then have you spoken to me in this way? Then Samuel took Saul and his young man and brought them into the hall and gave them a place at the head of those who had been invited, who were about 30 persons. And Samuel said to the cook, Bring the portion I gave you, of which I said to you, put it aside. So the cook took up the leg and what was on it and set them before Saul. And Samuel said, See, what was kept is set before you. Eat, because it was kept for you until the hour appointed that you might eat with the guests. So Saul ate with Samuel that day. And when they came down from the high place into the city, a bed was spread for Saul on the roof, and he lay down to sleep. Then at the break of dawn, Samuel called to Saul on the roof, Up, that I might send you on your way. So Saul rose, and both he and Samuel went out into the street. And as they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to pass on before us. And when he has passed on, stop here yourself for a while, that I may make known to you the word of God. Chapter 10, verse 1. Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over his people Israel? And you shall reign over the people of the Lord, and you will save them from the hand of their surrounding enemies. And this shall be the sign to you that the Lord has anointed you to be prince over his heritage. When you depart from me today, you will meet two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zalza, and they will say to you, The donkeys that you went to seek are found. And now your father has ceased to care about the donkeys and is anxious about you, saying, What shall I do about my sons? Then you shall go out from there farther and come to the oak of Tabor. And three men are going up to God at Bethel, and there they will meet you, one carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine. And they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall accept from their hand. After, you shall come, after that, you shall come to Gibeath Elohim, where there is a garrison of the Philistines. And there, as soon as you come to the city, you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with harp, tambourine, flute, and lyre before them, prophesying. Then the Spirit of the Lord will rush upon you, and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. Now when these signs meet you, do what your hand finds to do, for God is with you. Then go down before to Gilgal, and behold... I, will, I am coming down to you to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait until I come to you and show you what you shall do. Now when he turned his back to leave Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all these signs came to pass that day. When they came to Gibeah, behold, a group of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God rushed upon him, and he prophesied among them. And when all who knew him previously saw how he prophesied with the prophets, the people said to one another, What has come over the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And a man of the place answered, And who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, Is Saul also among the, prophet, the prophets? And when he had finished prophesying, he came to the high place. Saul's uncle said to him and to his servant, Where did you go? And he said, To seek the donkeys. And when we saw they were not to be found, we went to Samuel. Saul's uncle said, Please tell me what Samuel said to you. And Saul said to his uncle, He told us plainly that the donkeys had been found. But about the matter of the kingdom of which Samuel had spoken, he did not tell him anything. <laughs> That's a lot of text. I'm aware. 
What a story. What an interesting story. Some of you are going, really? Yeah, I think so. One of the great theologians of the 20th century was an Australian by the name of J. Siglow Baxter. J. Siglow Baxter. Now, speaking of this text and of Saul, he writes this. In some ways, he's very big. In other ways, he's very little. In some ways, he is commandingly handsome, and in other ways, he is decidedly ugly. All in one, he is a giant and a dwarf, a hero and a renegade, a king and a slave, a prophet and a retrobrate, retrobate, a man God anointed and a man possessed. How do you explain it? What happened to him? And what happens to so many? Interesting. We're going to discover as we go through these narratives in the next few weeks, as we look at the life of Saul, we're going to be reminded that this narrative isn't really about Saul. God is the hero of the text, always is, always will be. So let's keep that in mind this morning. Let's begin by asking the question, what do we know of this Saul? So if we go to verse 1, the first thing we discover is that he comes from a rather wealthy family. You may not have known that. Saul comes from a rather wealthy family. And we get a, a little bit of his pedigree, which, to be honest, is rather insignificant. In fact, he comes from a rural farm and the smallest tribe of Israel, Benjamin. To use common vernacular, he's a bit of a nobody. Verse 2, we get to learn more. We discover that Saul was a handsome young man. And I think we're meant to remember this detail of him later in the book when we discover that man looks on the outside, but God looks at the heart. That'll show up. So I think it's in Intentional that this is Saul's first quality listed. It's not necessarily a compliment. Nonetheless, we discover that there's not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than Saul. And we are told as part of this description that he was taller than any of the people. So clearly that's a good thing. So congrats to you tall men in the room, you studs. Uh, it's a good thing to be tall. Now let's talk about Saul's name for a second because this is kind of funny. It's actually kind of funny. The Hebrew word for Saul is from the verb to ask. You ever looked at your name in a baby book and wanted to know what it means? Anybody done that? Yeah? Well, if your name is Saul, it means to ask. Which is interesting because let's think about where we have come from and where we're going, the people just asked for a king. They just asked for a king. So God, in his humorous way, and I've said before, I do think God has a sense of humor, humor, all right? He says, fine, I know just the guy. His name is Asked For. So you asked for a king, I'm bringing you Asked For. Verse 3, starting in verse 3, we're introduced to some donkeys. Now, this might strike you funny, that we're reading a narrative about donkeys. We're not really reading a narrative about donkeys, but that's how it begins. And let me just remind you that in the ancient Near East, donkeys were valuable. Not everybody had a donkey. And if you had one, it was actually a symbol of wealth. And he's missing three donkeys. So original readers would have been like, ooh, you know, this is serious. And so he is sent off, Saul being he is sent off, we read in verse 3a, now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's, Saul's father, were lost. And, and here, I don't know, the future of Israel is hanging in the balance here. If we continue thinking of what we read last week, uh, a political revolution is, is simmering, but we're taking out to the can country to a, a little family who's lost some donkeys. You know what I love about the Bible? Like, this is real life. This is the real 11th century Israel. So Saul grabs one of the young sermon, the ser servants and takes off to find the donkeys. And we're told in verse 4 that they traveled all throughout the land of Benjamin, but didn't find them. 
In fact, they were so gone, long, they were gone for so long that Saul suddenly realizes, hey, if we don't find these donkeys soon, my father's going to stop worrying about them. He's going to worry about me. So we can guess they've been gone for a while and traveled some distance. In fact, the narrative specifically tells us that they ended up in the land of Zuf. Now, geographically, that may mean nothing to you, but you know what's in the land of Zuf? Ramah. And that's where Samuel lives. And Saul's servant knows this. So things are about to get interesting. So his servant says to him in verse 6, Behold, there is a man of God in this city, and he is a man who is held in honor. And all that he says comes true. So now let us go there. Perhaps he can tell us the way we should go. And then now this is where we need to stop for a second for observation number one. If you have your bulletin on the back, observation number one. Saul and his servant have set out to find some donkeys. That's how their day began. That's probably what they've been doing for several days. But instead of finding a donkey, they're going to find the prophet of God. The longer you live and the longer you walk with the Lord, the more this is going to happen in your life. The more you are going to experience this sort of thing where you go to set out to do one thing and it turns out the Lord is leading you in a direction quite different and better. Trust the Lord's leading in your life, even when things take a turn. You may be heading for a God encounter. So Saul says to his servant, well said, let's go visit this prophet. So they went to the city where the man of God was, verse 10, which we already know is Samuel. Now, let me share with you that I think we have the first hint that Saul is a flawed character. And it's very subtle. It's very subtle. Because I want you to notice, I want you to notice that we're talking about Samuel here. Samuel. And as honorable as Saul has been so far, thinking about his father and the way his father might be concerned, and having gone on this trip to find the donkeys in the first place, I mean, the good things that Saul has done, yeah, they're noticeable, but who is it that suggests that they go to the prophet? It's not Saul, it's his servant. It's his servant. It's a small flaw, but... It's going to become a big one later. In verses 11 through 13, they encounter some women. And these women say, hey, we know who you're looking for, and this is where you can find them. And then we get, they get, this, little, we get this dialogue in which they explain exactly where they can go find the prophet Samuel. And it seems like everyone in Israel knows where Samuel is, except for Saul. Except for Saul. I just find that a little odd. I mean, right now, in Israel, Samuel is the most famous person in the country. If you've been following along, like, everyone knows who Samuel is. Saul, right now, seems a bit clueless. Now, as a side note, I just want to say, notice where Samuel and his servant find the women. They find them at a well. Observation number two. If you go through a time machine to ancient Israel and you need to talk to a woman, go find a well. It worked well for Isaac, Moses, and now Saul. So, you know, just some pastoral advice. By the way, I do not believe in circumstances like this. I don't believe... Uh, and luck, and neither should you. So, so Saul and his servant head up to the city, and they do indeed find Samuel exactly where the women said he would be. And we find out that Samuel was expecting him. Listen to this. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, tomorrow, about this time, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him 
to be prince over my people Israel. He shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have seen my people because their cry has come to me. So the Lord tells Samuel, by the way, tomorrow, Samuel, you're going to meet the future king. Now, this is interesting. I wasn't going to say this. I have my script laid out because it could be a lengthy sermon if I'm not careful, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. This is interesting that at the end of last chapter, when the people cried out for a king, what did, what did God tell Samuel? He said, Samuel, go ahead and do it. They have not rejected you. They've rejected me. So go, Samuel, and give him a king. And it's interesting how chapter 8 ends. Samuel sends everybody home. Hey, hey Samuel. Did I miss something, or did God just go, give him a king? And Samuel goes, go home, everyone. Just go home. And Samuel is in no hurry to do this. So God is orchestrating events, and he is going to bring the person he's got planned to be king to Samuel, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. God is at work. And all of a sudden we discovered that those donkeys disappearing weren't circumstantial at all. Not at all. The Lord has orchestrated these events very carefully. Here is the real observation too. The one about going in a time machine was a joke. I hope you didn't write it down. The real observation number two. When the Lord starts moving the pieces in your life, rather than get upset, get nervous, get scared or disgruntled, just wait and see how the picture turns out. It's like putting together a puzzle piece. The Lord is building his kingdom. And you and I are part of that picture. Trust him. Trust him as he moves the pieces in your life. Which leads me straight to observation number three. And this is perhaps the most important observation I have this morning. Of all that I'm going to say. So listen carefully. Samuel only knew that Saul was the future king because God had revealed it to him. That's how he knew. No one can deduce God's purposes merely by observing events. It takes revelation. It takes revelation. So the important theological principle here is this. We only understand the work of God because he has spoken. Because he has spoken. So as the story continues, the narrator returns to the next day. Saul arrives in Ramah and Samuel sees him. And then we read in verse 17. When Samuel beheld Saul, the Lord said to him, Here is the man whom I spoke to you. It is he who shall restrain my people. Now, I've asked you to follow along this morning in your Bibles. It's a lot of text. And we're kind of going through this narrative quickly. If you happen to not have the ESV in front of you, if you're reading the NIV or something like that, you most likely don't have the word restrain. And I'll tell you that in this case, I like the ESV. I like what it says. I think restrain is the right word because the Hebrew word that is used here in other parts of the Old Testament doesn't ever really mean restrain. Or, I mean, it always, sorry, it always means restrain. So this word really means restrain. In other words, Saul would restrain the people. Now you might read that and go, that seems kind of odd. Let me read it again because, well, I really do think it sounds odd unless you have your theological antennas up. Here we go. You're reading through your Bible, you know, and you happen to get to 1 Samuel chapter 9, or, and you read this. When Samuel beheld Saul, the Lord told him, here's the man of whom I spoke to you. He it is who shall restrain my people. We, we kind of expect him to say, here is the man that will be king. Here's the man that will be king of Israel, the one I told you about. No, he doesn't say that. God says, here's the one that will restrain my people. Why that word restrain? What does that have to do with anything? Well, what does the word restrain mean? It means to hold back. In other words, Saul, God says, will be the, the one who will hold my people back. 
So the question must be asked, hold them back from what? What did they ask? What did they ask? In chapter 8, they asked for a king like all the other nations. Huh. God says, no. I am not going to give you that. I'm going to give you a king, but I have no intention of letting them become like all the other nations. So let's get something clear here. The Lord did not lose in the battle of wills between he and Israel. And that's my observation number four. Four. The Lord never loses. In a battle of your will against him, he always wins. He will never concede defeat to you or me, ever. Oh, but we might walk away thinking, we won that one. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah. You're being short-sighted. As the story continues, Saul will discover that his trip to find some lost donkeys wasn't really the purpose of his trip at all. He's going to meet the prophet Samuel. There's going to be a banquet. The Bible calls it a choice feast. Saul will be the guest of honor. This country boy from some obscure area in Benjamin. And then we're told that after the feast, verse 25, they came down from the high place into the city, and a bed was spread for Saul on the roof, and he lay down to sleep. Wow, what a day Saul is having. He meets a prophet, is the guest of honor, gets the choicest dinner that was set aside just for him, and then he gets to sleep. In a very nice place on the roof of a house. Observation number five. Houses in ancient Israel were, were built differently. Do not ever sleep on your roof. Okay? Don't do it. Don't sleep on a pitched roof. I'm telling you. It's just a really bad idea. Okay? That's observation number five. I hope you're listening. Now, when we get to the end of chapter 9, we encounter this really important verse. And look, at, when you're reading through the Bible, you can't skip over verses like this, or you're missing out something important. Verse 27. As they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to pass on before us, and when he has passed on, stop here yourself for a while, that I may make known to you the word of God. Well, this is getting good. Samuel is going to make known to Saul the word of God. Okay, here's the real observation, number five. God's word is powerful. God's word has power. Think about this for a minute. By God's word... He created all things. Genesis chapter 1, Psalm 33. God rules all things by his word. Hebrews 1, 3. Jesus Christ is the word become flesh. John chapter 1, verse 14. Colossians 1, 25. You may not be aware of this. The good news is God's word to the world. God's word has power. Everything that has happened so far in this chapter has been according to the word of God. And what Saul is about to hear is forever going to change his life. And listen to this. You and I, you and I will not encounter God's word unchanged. We will not encounter this unchanged. You realize that, right? If you encounter this and it does not change you, you're not listening. You're not listening. This has power. This has changed governments. This has rocked the world. You know that, right? Charles Dickens didn't do that. William Shakespeare didn't do that. I 
could name some other authors, but you know what? I'll stay there. But this, this has caused revolutions. This has been stirring the world for thousands of years. God's word has power. Then we get to chapter 10. And we discover at the beginning of chapter 10 that Samuel and Saul are now alone. They're now alone. The servant has left them. And this is what happens. And Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him and said, Has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over his people Israel? Hmm. This, this is a small point, but I want to make it. Here, Samuel says to Saul, word for word, exactly what the Lord told him to say. Samuel is a faithful prophet speaking the word of the Lord. Can I just say we really desperately need that in the church in the 21st century? We need preachers and pastors and people who will accurately teach and preach the word of the Lord. Samuel gives it word for word precise to Saul. Not only that, but when Samuel pours the oil over Saul's head, he doesn't say to Saul, I have anointed you, but he says, has not the Lord anointed you? In other words, Samuel is making it very clear he's just the messenger. This is the Lord doing this. Now Samuel will have a few more things to say. I'm going to go through this rather quickly. He's going to give now Saul three events that are going to transpire, which he calls signs, right? First will be that Saul will meet two men by Rachel's tomb, and they're going to let him know that the donkeys have been found and they're safe. And then he's going to go to the Oak of Tabor, and he's going to encounter three men who are going to give him two loaves of bread. And then the third sign is that when he gets home, he's going to, the first thing he's, he's going to discover is that the Philistines are there, and that's going to show up later as very important. But he's also going to encounter a group of prophets, and Saul is going to prophesy with them. And then we read in verse 9, and all these signs came to pass that day. So Samuel's prophecy came true. Now you ready for this? We also encounter something else in verse 9 that I love. We read this. And when he, that's Saul, turned his back to leave Samuel, God gave Saul another heart. I, I think that is a fantastic verse. What? An incredible thing we're reading here. The meeting began with Samuel saying, Stop here, Saul, that I might make known to you the word of the Lord. And then it ends with Saul walking away with another heart. Let me just tell you what. Let me say it again. I'll say it as many times as I have to. That's what happens when we encounter the word of God. It changes our heart. Can anyone testify to that? Anyone testify that this has changed your heart? Yeah. On October 7th, 1857, Charles Haddon Spurgeon was going to preach to his largest, largest audience ever. If you're not familiar with Spurgeon, he was a 19th century preacher in London. One of the great preachers in modern history. Spurgeon was going to be in front of 24,000 people at the National Day of Prayer at the Crystal Palace in London. So a few days before he was to be speaking at the Crystal Palace in front of 24,000 people, this is before the days of microphones, Spurgeon walked up on the stage in an empty building to test the acoustics. So he walked over here to this part of the stage and he yelled out, Behold, the Lamb of God who saves 
mankind. And then he walked over here and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who saves mankind. And he tried it in a few places. It's a true story. He tried it in a few places until he got it. Got it right and said, Yep, okay, I know where I will be standing on the day when I speak. And he left and went his way. Unknown to him, there were two men working up in the rafters that day. He thought it was empty, but they were way up high in the rafters fixing a few things before the big day. Both of them were unbelievers. One of them was so stirred by what he heard. Just one verse from Scripture. So stirred that he went home with this insatiable curiosity to know more. And that very man on his deathbed gave his testimony. That's why we know this is a true story. That on that very evening he came to know Christ. All from one man yelling at an empty building. Word for word, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That is the power of God's word. And it's the power of God's spoken word. And when God changes people's hearts, others notice. And that's one of the great apologetics for the gospel. A changed life. In chapter 10, verse 11, we read that when all who knew Saul previously witnessed how he had changed, they said to one another, said to one another, what has come over the son of Kish? I mean, they're watching this guy. They know him, right? It would be like, man, what happened to Schuster? I wonder how many people have said that about you. Well, that Tim, he is different. That Brendan guy. He ain't like the rest of the carpenters, builders, giant crazy thing maker. Like, what? And that's what they said. What has happened to Saul? Well, you want to know what? If you look at chapter 10, verse 6, you get the answer. He was turned into another man. Can I say it again? I think I'll say it again. God's word changes. Now, in fact, I am so convinced of this truth that I'm going to make a very bold statement this morning. If your life is not continually getting better, then I wonder if you're regularly reading God's Word. I'm going to say it. Because I believe it. I believe that when we are regularly in that divinely inspired, inerrant, infallible book written by God himself, and that we're regularly digesting it, we become better. Much better. We're better able to capable, and capable to handle the things that come our, way, our ways in this, in this life. Well... Our narrative then ends with a short dialogue between Saul and his uncle about his trip to find the donkeys. And then this kind of frames our narrative nicely from the beginning now to the end, and it brings it to a conclusion. But the last words of this chapter are worth repeating. But about the matter of the kingdom of which Samuel had spoken, he did not say anything. Now, I'll tell you what. Scholars like to argue whether they're talking about Saul's kingdom or the Lord's kingdom. Depends on the commentator you read. Do you want to know something? Let me just tell you right now. It doesn't really matter. And I'll tell you why it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because we're way beyond that now. We're in the New Testament. We're post-New Testament. And guess what we find out in the book of Mark? We see this guy named Jesus. And you know what he says? He says, the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. And it was at hand because he was at hand. In other words, the kingdom of God came into the world in the person and the work of Jesus Christ, and he changed everything. It doesn't matter back in 1 Samuel whether Saul's talking about, or it's talking about Saul's kingdom or the Lord's kingdom because the Lord Jesus' kingdom is here. And the word of the kingdom, as we just read earlier, 
this morning is being proclaimed. It was proclaimed throughout the Roman Empire. It was proclaimed to the ends of the earth. And if you're a student of history, you know what the Word of God accomplished. You know what it did in Rome and Europe and Africa and Asia and America. It transforms. It has power. Let me conclude. I know it's been kind of a lengthy message this morning. Let me just conclude then with what we've learned this morning. We've learned several things. Number one, we've learned that God's Word is powerful. It transforms lives. So don't let your Bible get dusty. Number two, that God is at work building His kingdom. He's not some deity on vacation somewhere who kind of spins the world and lets it do its thing, and He'll come back someday to see how it all worked out. No, that is not at all. God is actively involved in our lives. You never know what the Lord may have for you tomorrow. You may think you're just running an errand or going away for a few months when in fact He's leading you to an encounter with Him that could change your life. You never know. Trust God that He's leading in your life. As I wrap this up, I just want to say, I find it interesting how often God selected people for His kingdom when they were just off doing the ordinary. It's interesting, you know, Moses was tending some sheep and he sees a burning bush. Elisha's out there plowing his field. A guy named Elijah comes by and calls him to be a prophet. David begins his day running an errand for his dad and finishes the day by killing Goliath. Didn't know that's how his day was going to end when he started. Peter, James, and John are fishing. And Jesus of Nazareth comes by and says, drop what you're doing and come follow me. Saul goes chasing after some donkeys and discovers instead he's destined to be king. Last challenge, you and I need to be faithful with whatever the Lord has given to us to do because we never know what that might be. You know what Proverbs 19.21 says? You can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail.